Good evening. Uh, my name is John DeGravio, and I'm the student leader of the Williams College Society for Conservative Thought. Uh, first off, I'd like to begin by thanking all of you for taking the time and energy to brave all that cold weather and to come out and join us here tonight for what we hope to be a wonderful event. So our conversation this evening is titled, Diversity and the Liberal Arts. We'll be guided by the following questions. What does diversity really mean? How can diversity most effectively contribute to liberal arts education? To the extent that a college is lacking diversity, be it demographic, intellectual, ideological, or another form, how should it go about addressing it, and what are the legal ramifications of these approaches? Each of our guest speakers will deliver approximately 20-minute presentations. Our faculty moderator, Professor Darrell Paul, will then prompt a few guiding questions and then open the floor to Q&A with the audience. Our conversation will include discussion of some sensitive topics, including race and affirmative action policies. Our guest speakers have engaged with these topics while serving on the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights and before the United States Supreme Court, respectively, and are two of our nation's most distinguished authorities on these matters. To ensure that this discussion is held in the most free and inclusive manner possible, we invite all interested students to voice their perspectives in the Q&A session following the presentations. Additionally, after the conclusion of the event, student and faculty organizers will be available to hear any further feedback or questions. This event is only possible through the generous support of our many campus sponsors, it is part of the year-long series on race and democracy hosted by the W. Ford Schumann 50 program in democratic studies and also sponsored by 580 Capital, the Class of 1971 Public Affairs Forum, the Department of Political Science, Leadership Studies, and the Williams Forum. Our first speaker is Mr. Lawrence Purdy. Mr. Purdy is an of counsel attorney at the Maslon Tort Law Firm in Minneapolis. He served as a pro bono of trial counsel to the plaintiffs in two landmark U.S. Supreme Court cases, both of them involving race conscious admissions at the University of Michigan, and has spoken about these cases at the University of Texas, the University of Michigan, the Northwestern University Pritzker School of Law, and other colleges all across the country. Our second speaker is Dr. William B. Allen. Dr. Allen previously served on the National Council on the Humanities and is chairman and member of the United States Commission on Civil Rights. He's authored, authored several books on political philosophy and is currently the visiting scholar in conservative thought and policy at the University of Colorado Boulder. And then, of course, our Q&A moderator is our own professor of political science, Darrell Paul. Uh, so without further ado, please welcome our first speaker, Mr. Lawrence Purdy. For what it's worth, 
I've never argued that diversity in and of itself is a bad thing. On the contrary, I argue that all sorts of diversity can be a good thing and provide educational benefits to students. But I also deeply believe that no matter how beneficial any particular type of diversity might be, no school is justified in using racially discriminatory policies to achieve it. With that quick introduction, let me turn to race and share with you my perspective on the role it continues to play in our society. And let's talk specifically about how race impacts important decisions. Decisions such as who gets a particular job. Uh, decisions such as who gets a letter of acceptance or a letter of rejection from our flagship public universities or from our most prestigious private colleges, like the one where we're gathered this evening. The fundamental question, of course, is irrespective of our quest for diversity, what role, if any, should race play in these decisions? Well, that was the precise issue that I dealt with for the better part of seven years during two landmark United States Supreme Court cases, both involved, as Mr. DeGravio told you, the University of Michigan. One involved the law school, that case was known as Gratz versus Bollinger. The other involved the undergraduate school, and that was known, uh, I'm sorry, the other law school was Bruder versus Bollinger. The, the undergraduate case was Gratz. Uh, two different uh, systems, both heavily race conscious. The rationale offered by the university as its justification for resorting to the use of racially discriminatory policies was its claimed compelling interest in obtaining the educational benefits of a diverse student body. As many of you are no doubt aware, the Supreme Court, by a five to four vote, upheld the university's claim which overturned our trial court victory in the law school case. On the same day, the court struck down the university's race-conscious undergraduate system by a vote of six to three. Notwithstanding our victory in the undergraduate case, the law as it stands today, as reaffirmed in a more recent four to three decision in a case involving the University of Texas, continues to permit colleges and universities to explicitly consider the race or ethnicity of an applicant when making admissions decisions. And depending upon how one interprets Justice O'Connor's opinion in the law school case, these race conscious policies will be with us for at least another 10 years. And we can talk, of course, about the current state of the law, and I'll be happy to address questions, if, if any, uh, that, that you have at the end of this. But at this point, you may ask, why, Mr. Purdy, did you agree to get involved in these cases? And the answer is simple. What you see here is a quote taken from the second decision in Brown versus Board of Education, issued 63 years ago. It reaffirmed the court's first decision issued a year earlier in 1954. Let me tell you that I believe Brown versus Board of Education is the greatest and most important decision ever handed down by our Supreme Court, certainly in my lifetime. It established a principle shown here that to me says all we need to know about the role race should play in public education. And as a unanimous Supreme Court made clear in Brown, race should play no role whatsoever. The second reason why I got involved in the Michigan cases is captured in a straightforward language in Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And here it is. And I'm not going to read these slides to you. Just take a moment. And again, these words, just like those we just read from Brown, are crystal clear to me. Yet this language and its guarantee of non-discrimination has come under severe challenge due to the position taken by five justices in the Gruder case. Now before I go any further, let me tell you two things the Michigan cases were not about. First, the Michigan cases were not about criticizing the general concept that educational benefits are derived from diversity most definitely as it relates to racial diversity. As I said before, I believe diversity, and in particular, racial diversity, is a good thing. And second, these cases were not, repeat, not about dismantling affirmative action programs. Going back to what I said a few moments ago, I look at each and every one of you as a unique individual, and thus each of you adds to the diversity of this group. But judging the contribution you make to any group based on your skin color is to lapse into a viewpoint that race matters. Of course, Brown said otherwise, and the combination of the 14th Amendment with Title VI of the Civil Rights Act makes clear that race does not, indeed, cannot matter. 
And yet, since the court's 2003 decision in Grutter, our nation has markedly deviated from this principle. Today, for better or worse, we firmly regressed back into a situation where race matters. And I'm going to return to this in a minute, but let me briefly turn to affirmative action. Nothing you will hear me say tonight is intended to suggest we should dismantle affirmative action plans. It may surprise you to hear, but I'm an affirmative action proponent. I always have been. Properly defined, affirmative action has nothing to do with race. Quite the opposite. Affirmative action was originally intended to eliminate race as an obstacle to equal opportunity. It's for that reason I take the position that affirmative action should never end. We should keep it in perpetuity. And now for a little history lesson. Most Americans, and maybe most of you, are unaware that the phrase affirmative action was first coined by President John F. Kennedy in an executive order he issued in 1961. It began with these words. I'll direct you to the second paragraph because it's one of my favorites. Whereas discrimination because of race, creed, color, or national origin is contrary to the constitutional principles and policies of the United States. And then, of course, it's, it talks about the obligation of the United States to promote and ensure equal opportunity for all. Powerful constitutional principles contained in the preamble to President Kennedy's order. And then we get to his use of the phrase affirmative action. And there it is. That's where it starts. As you can see, President Kennedy's order was a directive to remove, not add race, as a factor in government employment and contracting. Affirmative action was universally understood as a method by which we intend to guarantee equal opportunity to every citizen irrespective of his or her skin color. Let me give you an example. No less an advocate for equal opportunity than former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and former U.S. Secretary of State Colin Powell said it best. Let's look at his words. They're simple, they're short, and it says everything that needs to be said. And obviously, I agree with what General Powell wrote. But his expression was not the first to post the preferences based on race. Let me share with you another view, this one coming approximately a century and a half before General Powell's words appeared. For those of you who may have seen that wonderful movie, Lincoln, starring Daniel uh, Day-Lewis, you might recognize the author of these words. He was a famous 19th century abolitionist who in his will established a home for homeless, a uh, school for homeless orphans. Thaddeus Stevens was the, was the individual appeared in the movie, fascinating character played by Tommy Lee Jones. What is important to note is that the long ago position taken by Congressman Stevens, as well as the more contemporary view expressed by General Powell, are both founded upon the same bedrock principle argued by Thurgood Marshall in Brown versus Board of Education. In Brown, when he was serving as one of the counsel for the black children denied admission to certain public schools because of their skin color, Thurgood Marshall asked the Supreme Court to enter a decree requiring the Topeka, Kansas Board of Education to, and I quote, discontinue the practice of using race or color as a criterion for admission of students to public schools. In my humble opinion, Mr. Marshall's words to the court are as relevant today as they were when he first pinned them back in the early 1950s as part of the voluminous briefing in Brown. To me, that was what the Michigan cases were about. And that was what the more recent Fisher case involving the University of Texas was all about. This is what the cases should have been about. In my view, our, our highest court should have used both cases to reaffirm the principle adopted in Brown over 60 years ago. That is, that racial discrimination in public education is unconstitutional. Period. End of discussion. But of course, it's not the end of the discussion. And so, as I said earlier, sadly, we're back to a situation in our country where race officially matters. Think about that. Race matters. That, of course, was the mantra of the old line of segregations. It was a concept I thought was unanimously rejected decades ago in Brown. And I thought it was legislatively buried by Title VI of the Civil Rights Act. But I was wrong, and instead the battle has moved to a different plane. 
rather than equal opportunity, irrespective of color or ethnicity, what has been our society's goal for more than a half century. We've reverted to an openly race conscious concept that's been relabeled as this interest in diversity. Now let me hazard a guess that we all agree that a policy that prohibits discrimination based on one's skin color is precisely what we ought to be practicing. And if there's any doubt about that, let's return home, right here to Williams College, and review what Williams says today about discrimination based on This is the Williams College Non-Discrimination Statement. Go online, it's posted, and this is what it says. You can read it for yourself. Pretty clear to me. The college states unequivocally it does not discriminate in admission on the basis of race, color, or ancestry. And this isn't the only statement the college publishes on this subject. Let's turn to the Equal Employment Opportunity Policy. Again, go online today. This is what you'll find. And once again, the language could not be more clear when it comes to employment opportunities for all individuals. And there's that word, individuals, not groups, individuals. These decisions, according to Williams' policy, fully comply with applicable federal law prohibiting discrimination based on race, end of quote. These unambiguous policies are fully consistent with President Kennedy's original formulation of affirmative action which is to say affirmative action means equal opportunity, not preferences based on race. Not to belabor the obvious, but there is nary a word anywhere in these statements to suggest the college is committed to anything other than strictly prohibiting racial discrimination on this campus. And that's a powerful statement to make. Of course, what Williams publicly preaches is exactly what it ought to be doing. For if nothing else is clear, this one thing should be clear. When it comes to judging the value and the worth of your classmates, your professional colleagues, indeed all of our fellow citizens, race should never matter. Race, this immutable factor, tells us nothing about a person's talent, skills, honor, courage, intelligence, or his or her dedication to any task. To paraphrase Dr. King, a man's skin color tells us nothing, absolutely nothing, about the content of his character. Was Dr. King right? I believe he was. And that was a simple message I had hoped our high court would adopt in the Bruder case, but it wasn't to be. Instead, we're saddled at least until 2028, for 10 more years, with diversity as an excuse for discriminating on the basis of skin color. We shouldn't be doing this, we don't need to be doing this, and the sooner we stop, the better off. I want to thank you for inviting me to participate in this. Uh, I look forward to you hearing Professor Allen speak, and we both look forward to taking your questions at the end of this. Thank you. discussion, a worthy discussion. Thank you, Mr. DeGravio, and members of the society, and Professor Miller, for the longest list of sponsoring organizations before which I've ever appeared. <laughs> I imagine you're very serious, and I would like to be serious too, but I'm old. <laughs> it's hard to be serious when you're old, because you've seen it all before. Nevertheless, I will try to give honor to the occasion and speak to the point. Before coming, I asked John de Gravio to share with you, or at least the members of the society, the chapter from the book Ending Racial Preferences, which I penned, which is chapter seven in that book, and which is entitled Moving from Diversity to Inclusion. I'm not going to read it to you. I only reference it now to say that uh, I'm looking forward to the conversation, and for those of you who have looked at it, I'll be happy to respond to any questions that you may have found in it. 
But I will reference it. I'll reference it for two reasons. One, to point to what you find in the conclusion of that chapter, namely my turn away from the discussion of political, legal, and social practices to the mission of the college or university. For I have often found it to be the case that we too easily lose sight of why we're gathered here on this campus or any campus when we subscribe to seeking to accomplish general social purposes without calibrating them with our specific mission. And you would think nothing would be more normal than to submit general social purposes to the test of conformity with institutional mission. And therefore, it represents something of a failure wherever that does not occur. A failure to take seriously what is a fiduciary responsibility to the institution, which is to make its mission first in our priorities. Yet, none of us can be surprised that we experience moments of intense social concern that sometimes lead us to forget why we're here, that sometimes distract us from our purposes. Because like missionaries, we embrace the general salvation of mankind before attending to the condition of our own souls. And so I'm here to say that the mission of the institution comes first. Now, whether you consider that mission liberal education or you construe it in other terms, everything else ought to be subordinated to it, even if it means to thumb one's nose at society in general. And we've often forgotten that education has always been in that posture of having to thumb its nose at orthodoxy. In fact, I suspect we often forget that education doesn't happen until we begin to thumb our noses at orthodoxy. And so the more we find ourselves wrapping ourselves in robes of orthodoxy on the campus, the more certain you may be that we're failing in our mission. I say that remembering the practice that transpired in 2016, the morning after the election, when in campuses all over the country, there were heartfelt missives transmitted to the entire community saying, we are so sorry. You must be hurting. We'll try to help you. We'll get over this together. What where our bromides those were? How insulting and unintelligent it was. How little conversant with the mission of the university. Oh, I don't know if you did that here. Pardon me, I perhaps I shouldn't speak so bluntly. Did that happen here? Yeah. Oh. Well, anyway. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> it happened everywhere. <laughs> so you aren't alone. Although, if you're serious about education, you ought to wish you were alone. Because that's what it takes to pursue truth in an atmosphere of open-ended inquiry. And so you will discover at the end of this chapter, which I reference, that I turn away from my recommendations regarding diversity and inclusion to remind those to whom I've addressed myself that the real purpose is the pursuit of truth in an atmosphere of open-ended inquiry. That's what liberal education is about. But is that incompatible with the goal of diversity? Is it incompatible with the goal of inclusion? Well, part of the burden of those remarks was to point out that diversity is the wrong word. Not that some of those worthwhile objectives that are celebrated in reference to diversity aren't worthwhile. They are. They're valuable. They're important. They deserve to be lifted up among us. But they don't define who we are. It's not an accident that it's called in the broader sense, a university and not a diversity. Those words share a root, but 
not the same step. The difference between one and two means everything. And therefore, when we introduce the word diversity with as much power as we do in our discourse, we are fostering a deflection from the common purpose, the oneness that brings us together in the educational pursuits. We're emphasizing difference where we intended to introduce community. And it's appropriate to ask ourselves if upon introducing difference, we are not surreptitiously undermining academic and intellectual community. As a matter of practice, I think that has happened all too much. And for that reason, I have recommended that we substitute the word inclusion for diversity. I did this quite a long time ago. And I'm somewhat pleased that inclusion has come to be embraced as a term that describes our objectives. Although I'm somewhat disappointed that it's only a halfway measure because almost everywhere we meet it, we meet diversity and inclusion. We didn't take the whole journey. So, <coughs> what I will emphasize tonight is what I regard as the importance of completing the journey. We started, and that's a good thing, and we're to be commended. We recognize that talking about diversity is somehow not really communicating what we want to communicate. Yes, we can go on and on about affirmative action and racial preferences. Uh, we can talk about equal opportunity. We can talk about all those things that in so many ways have structured our experience for the last two generations, starting with our concern with questions of race and, of course, terminating in a prolifer proliferation of protected groups that only emphasize what happens when difference becomes the standard rather than community. We will continue the centrifugal effect that difference introduces until we redirect our energies in such a way as to make clear that while all are welcomed in, all are welcomed into a single spirit of exertion which is intellectual accomplishment and the pursuit of truth. So let me just say some concluding words about that and then get to the conversation as quickly as possible. These concluding words take us back to the practical experience we have. And that practical experience I can summarize best by summoning up what William Bowen and Derek Bach introduced in their book, The Shape of the River a book which I commented on some time ago, but in some sense actually never really understood until I read Larry Purdy and, and recognized that it was more than what I thought it was because it was a book deliberately constructed to produce the result that was obtained in Grutter versus Bollinger. This was not just a happenstance occurrence that the book came out because, of course, the the case itself was long in gestation, and the Mellon Foundation put an awful lot of funds into it and made sure they had it out in time to influence the case. And so we need to stop and think about this. That there are people, uh, race brokers, I call them, I certainly would refer to Bill Bowen that way, there are people who have deliberately sought to introduce these terms of distinction in this society and to make them the basis of administrative conduct in a way that has prevailed over common sense. And there should be, on our various campuses, a far stronger spirit of critical appraisal of those things. So if we apply that to what was accomplished in Bowen and Bach's book, The Shape of the River, we'll discover something. The book cultivates a positive argument for race sensitivity on the claim that by practicing race sensitivity, and you can add all the other protected groups afterwards that follow, but the shape of the river, river focuses on race, by practicing race sensitivity, they argue, we are enhancing social productivity. It's a very straightforward argument. We are making the world better by practicing race sensitivity. Now, all you've got to do to accept that proposition 
is to accept the premise that there are a blessed few whose race sensitivity is benign. And now those blessed few comprise Bill Bowen and Derek Bach. I'm sure there are a few others, but they're the ones who published the book. Now, that's an extraordinary claim to bow down to. Simply extraordinary. And I would think that any human being who had decent self-respect would express indignant outrage upon hearing it, whatever the person's race, gender, or other identifying term might be. Why? Because what it actually conveys is a very simple formulation. You're not as good as we are, and we need to take care of you. Now that's the underlying dynamic. That's the underlying dynamic we're dealing with when we're dealing with the regime of race preferences. Whether we're talking about the beneficial effects of diversity or anything else, ultimately we are bowing before, yielding to a judgment about the capacities of individuals. For example, the cohorts analyzed by Bowen and Bach are designated among the black students at these 28 elite institutions as retrospectively rejected. I love the euphemisms of pseudoscience. <laughs> but one, one ought to <laughs> consult some of the more trenchant criticisms of that practice, but I won't, I won't digress. Anyway, retrospectively rejected, meaning they didn't deserve to be there. So in order to accept the justification of preferences, you had to accept the judgment that the people receiving the preferences were not qualified. That was their argument. They made it successfully. They persuaded Sandra Day O'Connor. They set the terms of law in the United States based on an argument of inferiority. And here's the great and wonderful thing they accomplished. They got the very victims of their judgment of inferiority to agree with them in very large numbers. People who would say, yes, we have been victimized and we are not capable and you should take care of us. What can you imagine more emotionally and psychologically corrosive than that? There's a long history that explains how we fell into this pattern of victimology and how it has so insidiated itself in our culture that it has become a completely destructive and disruptive force. But surely it doesn't take the telling of a long history for an intelligent listener to see that there's something perverse in this. Extraordinarily perverse, not happenstance perverse, and therefore it should call our attention to a strident and important, uh, a, a turning point in cultural moments. How come we to be this way? And how can we change? So to my mind, the conversation today about racial preferences or affirmative action or diversity, or yes, now inclusion until we clean up our language, has to become how are we going to save ourselves? I believe by the terms of the conversation, uh, it has fallen to me the task of beginning uh, our conversation. So what uh, I hope to do is really just um, to pose two questions to uh, both of our speakers to sort of launch things uh, based on what they've said here and then to turn it over to, uh, to the group and uh, to continue on until the end of, of our discussion tonight. So the first, um, the first question I have follows on, I think, an insight that, uh, that Mr. Purdy gave and then was followed up quite well by Professor Allen. And it is this, that there is this question of individuals versus and I think uh, Mr. Purdy gave quite, um, uh, a, a, quite a strong argument for treating uh, people as individuals rather than as members of groups. This, of course, puts aside the very question of representation that I think is 
at the heart of much of the uh, practices in admissions that we see in the United States today. And so I thought Professor Allen had a very interesting kind of engagement with that when you mentioned this connection, if you will, or, or, or the attempt to connect, as you said, general social purposes with uh, the, the specific mission. And certainly there is the claim that one hears, one hears it at Williams College as well as many other places, being on the faculty and being involved in, in, in faculty hiring on search committees. Um, I am required to go to certain kinds of events and one hears uh, exactly these arguments at these events that not only is there no conflict between general social purposes about representation, um, but in fact there is complete and total agreement between them. So I think the fear uh, that Professor Allen has about um, the, the centrifugal forces, if you will, um, those in authority and in power in higher education just simply do not believe this is true. And I wonder, um, is, it, is it essentially the, is it an ideological case? Is it a political one? I think towards the end of uh, Professor Allen's talk, I think he, he, he sort of begins to point towards what he thinks is at the root of this, but I, but I would like to, to hear um, a little bit from both of our speakers about this insistence that the general and the specific have no clash, have no contradiction, they are totally compatible with one another, and so therefore we can do uh, the, the specific mission of education and the pursuit of truth along with the general purposes of representation. Would you like to go first? Would you like to go first? <laughs> to the more academic discussion uh, aspects of this to both Professor Paul and Professor Allen. I, I was a lawyer in, in this case. I actually was a lawyer. I'm sure Professor Allen and I can both talk about this. I, I, I was a young man that grew up pre-Brown versus Board of Education. I grew up in Oklahoma. I grew up in a segregated community, lawfully segregated, lawfully segregated under a Supreme Court case decided seven to one, plus E.B. Ferguson back in 1896, which established separate but equal doctrine. Horribly misnamed doctrine, but separate but equal. And that was the law of the land for almost 60 years until Brown. And Brown was reversed unanimously, nine to zero. I remember I was eight years old when it happened. So I, I, I all I can tell you is that Having grown up, seen the impact of what segregating people by race, dividing us by race, characterizing us by race, giving benefits to certain people, and of course to certain people, the, 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 the unequal people back when I was a young boy in my little town in Oklahoma, the unequal people were based, on, were decided solely their skin color. And it was wrong. It didn't take an eight-year-old an eight-year-old understood. And so I, I, I look at, I, I guess the way I look at the issue of using race, I'm all, when, when I say I'm in favor of diversity, I think there's also, I think diversity, again, every one of you, if we were to sit down and go through each individual in this, in this audience and ask you about your personal experiences, we'd be shocked, I'm sure, at how different each and every one of us are. Having maybe virtually nothing to do with skin color or this having to do just with your own personal experiences. And I, I, I think that every time race is used to divide us, it, it creates horrible pain and injustice. And it actually penalizes everybody in today's, the, the system today, I think, diminishes us all. It's condescending to suggest that anyone based on skin color needs an extra leg up in order to Peter Williams, I don't believe that for one minute. I don't believe it for a minute. But that's the that's that's the conclusion that you can't help but. In fact, uh, uh, Bowen and Bach, president of Harvard and and Princeton, respectively, or vice versa, uh, 
Professor Bach was the head of Harvard and Professor Bull was the head of Princeton. Uh, if you read their book, even though they were proponents for the policy, the fact is they outline all the, all the terrible things that arise out of it, including stigma. And I, I started to bring the book with me because a Williams graduate from 1993 was actually quoted. She was an African-American graduate of Williams, and the one thing she complained about, she said, she, I'm sick of these diversity committees at my work claiming that they want me to come in for photographs just to put me in a diversity. Uh, you know, I mean, if that's what you want me for, I, I want you to want me because I went to Williams, I did a good job, I'm a smart woman, I can, I can do the job. So I, I, um, I'm probably not answering your question, Professor Paul, I'm sorry, I'll probably get a very poor grade here. Uh, but, uh, but I just think that what we've done from a legal and social standpoint is, is wrong. It's well intended. I'm not arguing about the intentions of people that have instituted some of these policies. I never have argued about their intentions. But I think just when you look at it, every time race is used to divide us, it, it is harmful, it's divisive, it's painful, it's unjust, and we are better. We should, we should strive to end it. Well, I shall so try to address the question of the general in particular and whether there's tension between them, but I must first make an observation that, that the claims of no tension are typically based not on any objective knowledge or demonstration, but on anecdote. Just as the whole shape of the river consists of anecdote, not objective demonstration. It pretends to be objective demonstration, but for a number of technical reasons it is plain that, that it is not sufficiently so. Now, uh, I would commend to everyone to read the very short chapter in Albert Murray's The Hero and the Blues, if you want to understand what's going on here. Uh, that there's a highly intelligent critique of pseudoscience in the form of social science that applies specifically to Bowen and Bach's book, though he was not the subject, that was not the subject of his essay. But you'll understand it immediately if you read that tiny little essay. But let me go beyond that and, and share just a brief passage which, which addresses your question, I think, fairly specifically, and then raises the real issue, which is why we don't find convergence between the social mission and the institutional mission. Uh, the, the question of where we are today is primarily a question of whether assimilation or permanent diversity is the likeliest consequence. Remembering diversity means different. Bowen and Bach implicitly acknowledged this by asking their 1976 and 1989 cohorts from the highly selected colleges and universities whether while in college they managed to get to know well two or more minority or majority students in the case where the student was the other. As an index of assimilation, this is perhaps only slightly less pallid than the old expression, some of my best friends are. Nonetheless, it does represent the principle that assimilation is the goal. I want to underscore that. Assimilation is the goal. Let us conclude, therefore, that the best way to answer the question of where we are today is in the form of some approximation to the degree of assimilation. Because assimilation necessarily means a decline in consciousness of otherness, then the measure would have to be in some fashion an assessment of the declining significance of race. So if the general goal is the declining significance of race. And what we are experiencing is the opposite. It is plain that we are not accomplishing the general goal. So how does that fit the mission of the university? We'd be forced to ask ourselves. Let me illustrate it still further for you. An old philosopher, Aristotle, told us in a very simple expression what it takes to create a viable community. His answer was intermarriage. Simple. Intuitive. Well, of course, if race doesn't matter, it will not show up in the one area of life and culture where it is most pronounced, in the selection of mate. Our institutions do not urge us to go out and marry across lines of race or ethnic identity. There's a single administration, I'm sure Williams isn't one either, that is proclaimed publicly in a missive to the community, you ought to practice intermarriage. And yet it claims to be committed to the general proposition. The point is the claim is false in the first place about the general proposition. 
and it's inconsistent with the mission of the university, which isn't to be missionaries to us, but to foster in us the search for truth. One more brief question, which I think follows very much upon uh, what Professor Allen said. And it does get to the mission of the university. So many of these cases and the discussion about um, diversity in college admissions animates elite institutions. And elite institutions are um, jumping off points, opportunities for admission into the generalized elite of American society. And so to go to Harvard uh, means something quite different than to go to MCLA, which is Massachusetts College of Liberal Arts down the road in North Adams. And so because so many benefits, or at least we certainly believe, that so many benefits of American society flow from where one went to school, um, the stakes are, are high. People certainly act as if the stakes are, are extremely high to get into Williams versus some uh, lesser institution. If diversity is not a principle that governs admissions to opportunities to become elite or to maintain one's elite status, um, what principles should be used? I'll, I'll take that first. Uh, th this is an item which is highly emphasized in the chapter I referenced to you, moving from diversity to inclusion, in which I have demonstrated, I think, with a tolerable uh, persuasiveness and certainly with a great deal of documentation and systematic inquiry, that our institutions, in fact, do not exert themselves to accomplish even that purpose. Why? Because they take the cheap way out of preferences which creates a whole host of cascading effects and which if you take the assumptions seriously, you must then trace all the way down the ladder of higher education to see at each rung you have people who are misplaced, missorted, based on the premise of the elite institutions. But that itself is not sufficient to dispose of it. In addition, what I've shown is there is a direct way to attract diverse student bodies which involves capital, investing, and in reaching out intelligently, and finding people who are not otherwise aware of the opportunities open to them. That it doesn't require a preference regime, which is the cheap way out, the cheap skate way out, I should say, but involves robust recruitment, going where, in fact, the fish are to do your fishing. You have all of these elite institutions, most of them were established by religious traditions. Almost none of them have preserved enough of those traditions to recognize how important it is to reach into church communities to find recruits. They poach on a few recognizable schools from which they can expect to draw talented, relatively qualified talent, and they ignore the vast sea of opportunities out there. So, in other words, they are hypocrites. They profess one thing and do the other. And all of the claimed benefits of diversity are screens for their laziness. I'm being awfully harsh tonight. I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm going to soften him up. I'll soften him up right now. But no, no, no. Let me, let, let, uh, when Professor Allen talks about outreach, uh, first, I, I know he shares this view that I share. There is incredible talent in every community. This country. It's not, it's not, it's not divided up by race. There's incredible talent in every community. Let me give you a, a this is a fact, this isn't a, an anecdote. After uh, Grutter was decided, and it suddenly became apparent that universities could go back to using explicit uh, uh, consideration of race, Texas A&M University, in uh, uh, the second major public, if you will, university in, in Texas. Uh, they'd say they were the first, but uh, the, the president was Robert Gates. You may remember uh, uh, Secretary Gates. He was the Secretary of Defense under both uh, President Bush and then President Obama. And Robert Gates was the president. And he said, you know what? We're not going back to race. We're not going to use race, even though Grutter said we can. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to take our money. We're going to go into communities throughout Texas, and Texas is I mean, you, you can't imagine unless you're from Texas. I know John is from Texas. If 
but it, it, it's huge. And there were tons of communities, Hispanic communities, black communities, who had never experienced really Texas a and probably many hadn't even heard of it, even though there were black students and Hispanic students and, and all sorts of students at Texas a and m But they, Gates says, what we're going to do is we're going to spend our money going out to every one of these communities, and we're going to tell these, these young men and women, we want you at Texas a and And they were successful. He said, he also said this, we're not lowering the standards for anybody. We're not going to change the standards for anybody. We're not going to play this game of, well, you know, we're going to look holistically and then, you know, uh, set up a two-tier standard based on test scores or grades or whatever. But we're going to go out and we're going to, we're going to go to the communities that have traditionally never have been underserved at Texas A&M. And they proved to be successful without using race. I think the university is still following that policy. And they were supported by many of the black student groups at Texas a and who said, we want you here, but we want you here only if you want to be an Aggie. This is the community. They, if you want to be an Aggie, not a, a black Aggie or a white Aggie or a Hispanic Aggie, we want you here if you want to be an Aggie. Now, it's, that can be done by all sorts of schools, and schools such as Williams with more money than a lot of other schools had. That's one, that's one way of doing outreach without consideration of race. You go, you're going to places that where there may be members of racial groups that have not routinely, maybe hadn't even heard of Williams. But the talent's there, so make the effort. And diversity, racial diversity, will take care of itself. Let me just follow up briefly to sure. say, uh, to endorse uh, what Mr. Purdy has said, uh, to tell you that I've actually done it myself while serving as dean of the premier college at Michigan State University, and for which people fought to get in. Uh, I wore out shoe leather, as well as money, going to communities and communicating to students that the opportunity was theirs to take. And particularly in that case, because it was first come, first serve. All they had to do was formulate the intention and file the application, understanding the rigors of the program that they would be entering into. But communicating that broadly was the key to our performance, which was extraordinary. And so when I make my harsher comments, I make them against the background of professional practice in this regard. I really do know what it takes to accomplish the result. And therefore, when I say people who don't do that are lazy, I really mean it. I want to tell you that my mother wanted me to go to Harvard. This is a long, long time ago. I never went to Harvard. I never applied to Harvard. Why? We had no idea that we could. We certainly didn't have any money to pay for it. We had no idea how it would be paid for or how to get in. And we certainly never heard from Harvard. Made all the difference. Now, did it make a difference in my life? No. No. I, 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 I've been blessed in extraordinary ways. Uh, and so, so I don't regret that. But what I'm telling you is, Harvard could have made an impression on me that would have changed the course of things if Harvard hadn't been cheap and lazy. So those of you thinking about postgraduate work at Harvard. <laughs> <laughs> I think my role from here on out is to call on hands that are raised in the audience. Uh, let's start in the back on the left. My left. Right? Yes. Should I stand or anything? Yes, here? please. Yeah. Um, Thanks for coming. My name is Kai Cash. I'm a senior here. And uh, given the discussion that we've had today, I had like a, like a, a very long-winded comment, but I, it does end in a question. Um, so a large part of the, I wrote it down so that I wouldn't forget. <laughs> a large part <laughs> of the argument surrounding not approaching admissions holistically uh, makes a lot of large assumptions about the institutions that surround us. Um, and so my first question would be, uh, which we can address at the end, would you agree that the political context in which someone lives or a group lives influences their decisions or their perceptions? Uh, and I think that there's some interesting work, for instance, in economic history that shows in post-World War II Germany, when East and West Germany were divided, that the perceptions of individuals that lived in the communist regime were very different from those that lived in West Germany. And so that's just evidence for that sort of political context, uh, the context 
having influence on the way that people are acting. And I mention this uh, because I think that the historical underpinnings, if they don't have an effect on the ability to compete at Williams, certainly have an effect on the admissions to Williams and places of the like. So I think we've made an interesting case um, about moving forward, but I wonder what you guys think of the role of historical injustice in the discussion and role that current leaders and members of societies have to address uh, sort of the manipulated and dominant perspective in regards to admission. And what follows from that is that we, we spoke a lot also about capitalism and, and uh, sorry, capital allocation and professionalism. Uh, and even the example of Texas A&M leads me to ask, you know, to what extent does the emphasis on individuality that you were mentioning uh, during your talk stem from sort of hegemonic discourse in a capitalist society and diverge from the essence of community? So we spoke a lot about how uh, we are really should be wedded to the mission of the institution, uh, and and that is, or ultimately the pers the pursuit of truth. But why does the pursuit of truth have to diverge from recognizing individuals for those differences? I would argue that some of the differences that constitute, I guess, people within the society do contribute to that overall pursuit of truth. And so, just wondering about the role of that as well. Um, well, let me let let me address your your question about historical injustice. Uh, as I said, I. I I think we can all appreciate and understand the view of, of every human being who says there, there were historical injustices committed and we could tell, feel terrible about them and we're sorry they happened and, you know, but as Thomas Sowell wrote, and he's written eloquently about it, you can't go back, you know, if, if we could go back three or four hundred years and and find the people responsible for enslaving our, our black brothers and sisters, then you know, then maybe we could we could exact some social justice. But you can't you can't do that. All you're doing is perpetuating just another class of social injustice. And I'm not I'm you know whoever whoever is denied something based on let's say skin color or based on any particular uh, immutable characteristic. I mean that's that creates a social injustice. I think I think actually, I, I love the, the quote from Dr. Martin Luther King. I think it's in a letter from a Birmingham jail. He says, "An injustice to any man is, is injustice to every man." And so, I, if that no one in here is responsible for the injustices from 150 years ago, so you can't go back and remedy it. And the truth of the matter is, the courts have already said that. Justice Powell in the Bakke decision, where the diversity rationale was first actually raised, made the point, you know, that you, you can't go back and, and correct inherent misjustices from the past. You can correct current injustice. If you're, the, if you're a victim of injustice today based on race, you've got, a, you've got a, a claim. And you know what? Call me. I'll represent you. Because you do have a claim. But trying to, uh, uh, you know, go back uh, centuries, it, it's just a never-ending uh, Never ending. You just never end. I'll give you. I'll give you one more example. I, I, I have to do this. I, uh, I told you I was from Oklahoma. Yeah. So is Senator Elizabeth Warren. She grew up in Oklahoma, and she's obviously uh, recently decided to proudly release her DNA results, which showed, as I think is unequivocal, she has less potential Native American DNA than the average American. At which I thank her for this, because if it were up to me, I would eliminate all the race boxes on applications. I would eliminate them. I, I don't want to know. I don't care what your uh, your race or ethnicity is. I care about you as an individual. I'll read about you as an individual. Incidentally, I'm not on the admissions committee, so no one has to, to worry one way or the other. But but um, uh, she claims Cherokee heritage. So I'll tell you. Here's a, here's a. Does anybody know the history of the Cherokees in terms of slave owning? Yeah. Okay. They were a slave owning tribe. They, they, when the, the, the last Confederate general to surrender was a Cherokee chief named Stan Waddy. He was a slave owner. When the war was over, the U.S. government rewrote its treaty with the Cherokee, released all their slaves, gave them land, 
and, and, and penalized severely the Cherokees. And they weren't the only tribe. Choctaws, Chickasaws, Seminoles, the Creeks. They were all, but they were Native Americans, and today that would be one of the protected groups, supposedly. But here's the question, social justice question for you. Should, uh, let's say, a young Elizabeth Warren who claims Native American ancestry applies for admission and a school has a policy that says we're going to give a preference because that's an underrepresented minority. Is, it, is social justice accomplished by giving a, the descendant of a Cherokee slave owner a spot in the Williams class of 2023 <coughs> over a white descendant of an abolitionist who gave his life to end the institution of slavery? I mean, this is the problem in trying to go back historically and do all these things. I don't want to penalize Elizabeth Warren for what the Cherokees did. She didn't have anything to do with it. But this is the silliness that, that, that if you try and go back and talk about these historical injustices, you just, it, it's, it, it's a, you can't do it. And you can't resolve it and you can't make up for it. So we need to do what's right moving forward. That's why I think. I should add a footnote that the Cherokees, long after and until relatively recent times, long after the end of the war, uh, also barred black descendants from their slaves from and from the Cherokees right. from participating in any of the privileges of the tribe. So basically they perpetuated Jim Crow well into the 20th century to boot. But that's neither here nor there. I, I want to take up the perception question, the historical development question, because it's the one that I find most frequently resorted to wherever I go. And I think there's a fundamental misconception associated with it, which is best understood if we ask ourselves a simple question. If what we believe, our perspectives, and what we assert is a product of a prior series of events that have produced us, is what we're engaging at the moment anything other than a mimetic exercise? That is to say, if we don't have the ability to think about what is and raise the question of truth because we're simply reflecting inherited perspectives, what is the point of deliberation? Are we only to line up, as it were, in categories, the various perspectives we've had, and who knows what? assume that we take some kind of calibration, ask which one has the greatest weight, because we have nothing to contribute of ourselves. We can only reflect what we have been made to be. Or do we rather think that we participate at some fundamental level in developing our ideas, in testing our beliefs, in challenging our prejudices, received perceptions and convictions? There's a dilemma, and you have to choose where you're going to stand on that dilemma. You can't make the argument from social structures and at the same time pose the test of your judgment of those social structures. Either you are an East Berliner or a West Berliner, and everything you believe expresses East Berlin or West Berlin, or you're an individual capable of judgment independently. And it's either or, not both and. Uh, Jeremy Meredith, uh, I'm a sophomore. My question is, both of you had mentioned that you both think, uh, theoretically or, or whatnot, that race ought not to matter, race should not matter. Uh, my question relates to the fact that in reality and in practice, whether you believe, or most people would say that race does matter and that race has impacted people's lives. I was wondering if you agree with that. You may think that race ought not to matter, should not matter, but does it? And then that follows up to my next question of, if colleges and uh, universities should not sort of lower any standards um, when, when sort of students or people are applying to schools at that moment in time, does that discount uh, things in, in that student's past, whether that be they were treated differently based on their race, based on their socioeconomic status? Um, does the college do a disservice by discounting 
uh, things in, in that student's background that were beyond their control, uh, circumstances that they didn't really have any um, direct say in that impacted their lives. Uh, if the college, if colleges and, and uh, you know universities do a disservice to those students um, in the college admission process. Uh, let, let me take it first. Let me give a couple of answers to that. I think race does matter. You misunderstand me if you think I say it doesn't. But I do say it, it doesn't matter for admission to college. And so when we use a generalization such as race matters, uh, that is, of course, a mere truism. The question is, where does it matter and for what does it matter? Illustration. My daughter went off, and I will only tell this story because she's told it publicly so I can repeat it. My daughter went off to Princeton University when she started college. And she arrived on campus only to be greeted by some university administrators, admissions, students, affairs type officers who see her when she arrives and the first thing they say to her is, why didn't you tell us you were black? And the question is, what difference would it have made? Are you trying to tell me I wouldn't have been admitted? Or are you saying, well, I have been admitted, so you can't say I would have been admitted because I was black. Why do you need it to know? In other words, they made an issue out of something that didn't matter. She happened to be a particularly strong student, a genius, in fact. And there's no question about her getting into Princeton. And so there was no reason for Princeton to raise that particular issue. So how does that address your second question? Well, think about it this way. Every admissions decision discounts something that happened in your past. Think about it for a second. You don't reveal everything that's happened to you from the moment of birth. Many of those things could have had an influence on who you are. The university doesn't know anything about them. Every decision discounts the bulk of your past experience because it's unknown. And even if they had a literal record of all the days and events of your life, guess what? Something would still be unknown. Do you know what that is? What you think and feel. Because as Alexander Hamilton tells us in the first Federalist paper, that's the one thing none of us has access to. What someone else's motive is. We cannot know it. So we should avoid simple-minded arguments that try to persuade us that we are omniscient. We are not omniscient. And therefore, humility, a due sense of human fallibility, ought to induce us to err on the side of limiting discretion in making these decisions, not broadening it. And so if you push me to the ultimate end of my argument, you will discover that I actually have published an argument which says, college has no business deciding who can come or who couldn't come. All the college should do is publish the standards and adhere to them strictly and say, first come, first serve as to who meets them. And it's ridiculous for us to endorse the assertion by university officials that they have a right to pick and choose. Why don't you have a right to pick and choose? Does your grocer have a right to pick and choose who's going to buy the bananas? No. And they're no better than grocers. Let, let, me, let me follow up on it. I think that there's a, a misconception also about suggesting that we're going to look at, uh, let's just say, test scores are great. Since this is, you know, Williams is clearly one of the schools that were your SATs and ACTs, grade points, you know, the courses you took, all that. It's all important. High, high, high priority. But I can't believe that the admissions people also don't look and evaluate. Well, maybe, maybe my, maybe my SAT is more important to them. But I grew up, let's say, hypothetically, uh, in a poor community in a, in Oklahoma. Public schools weren't as good, maybe hypothetically. But it looked like I was really working hard. And let's say I, you know, I wasn't able to do certain things extracurricular activities because I had the, you know, the typical, I had the after the school job that I had to help my family get my, if I'm an admissions person, I'm going to look at that. And if you have 1800s on your SATs, but the kid from Oklahoma has got uh, 1650 or 1700, let's say that's, you know, that's still pretty good, still pretty good. Uh, but it shows that he's overcome some disadvantages. I'm clearly going to take that into consideration. I also think that Williams does. I, I can't imagine they don't. I would almost wager, I wish, I'm a, I'll make this proposal, no one's ever taken me up on it. But I think it would be fascinating for a school like Williams to run a dual admissions uh, experiment. And one group of applications, uh, uh, that one group decides uh, admissions based on applications where there is no race or ethnicity. Everything 
else is involved. You can tell your story, where you came from, if there's you know disadvantages, socioeconomic disadvantages, uh, class preferences. There's fascinating studies showing how using class preferences actually can uh, create the same, if not exceed, current racial diversity numbers on many elite campuses. And it's, it, they've been done. I mean, I haven't done them, but I've, I've, I've read the studies, I've seen the studies. And they're, these are done by, incidentally, proponents. Proponents for using race if it worked. They concluded it, it, it doesn't work for a lot of reasons. So, you know, just to, to kind of reassure you, I don't think that, uh, you know, but what Professor uh, Allen is saying is set the standard then and then whatever it is, it is. I mean, the standard may include, we're going to we're going to consider all your background. And, and that's fine. That's fine. If, you, if you're going to set a standard, however, that says we're going to take the top SAT and ACT, or the top SAT and GPA people, well, then, then you're going to get the top SAT and GPA people. That's first come, first serve. Could you set the standards and you're not going to deviate? You shouldn't deviate based on race or gender or whatever. Uh, but that's not, I don't think that's the way it really works. I, I don't think your concern is that people will ignore the, 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 the elements that you're talking about. Yes, we almost have a debate now. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so let me just uh, re reply that, that I don't by any means intend to depreciate the, the genuine concern with humanity that you hear expressed in, in Larry's remarks. Now, I share those. And as long as people are evaluating and making these decisions, I think there's nothing wrong with their responding in humane fashion to our narratives, our respective stories. But that means, of course, that these rather benign considerations are not freighted with the systematic distortions introduced by racial, gender, and even religious and other terms of identification, which are ascriptive rather than particular or individual. So, so that uh, I would say if you're still in a universe where those decisions have to be made, they should be made in as humane a fashion as possible. My ideal universe would say, don't give anybody the power to do that. Make them be transparent. Make them tell you who they are up front and let you make the decision whether you want to be one of them or not. That's the way I would do it in an ideal world. Thanks, Daryl. Uh, Rob White, I work in the Dean of Students office. Professor Allen, uh, I was one of Bill Bowen's ghost writers when he was president of Princeton University and mm -hmm. I thought your comments about the shape of the river were different from those that I've heard elsewhere. You recall in that book that um, one of the database observations Bowen and Bach made was that um, a person's chance of getting into one of those elite colleges, if their parents had gone to those elite colleges, was vastly greater than it would be if they were um, people of color, for instance. Uh, that hasn't changed among our peer institutions since the book was written. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are a number of non-academic uh, considerations that come into account that actually align more with uh, privilege than not. Um, uh, consideration is given to performance athletes. Uh, people who perform well in athletics tend to go to schools that are resourced in a way that allows them to achieve their potential. Um, Waves and other places also take legacy into into account. Mm -hmm. Do either of you have any trouble uh, with those kind of non-academic criteria, as long as they're fairly expressed in the admission materials? I, I, I can let, let me address that because I, I, we dealt specifically with that in the Michigan cases. Our proposal in, in Michigan, both undergrad and law school, but in undergrad they actually had a point system that assigned a, a, a significant number of points. So if you had a legacy parent or grandparent parent, you got extra points for, towards undergraduate. Uh, Harvard and Princeton, well, in fact, if, you, if you're if you familiar with Bowen and Bach's work, you, you saw they were very much against get, uh, doing away with legacy. They were very much in favor of legacy preferences. They want to keep legacy preferences, and there's a good argument for it. I mean, the argument 
experiment is you, you develop institutional, uh, uh, you know, people who are supportive of the institutions, people who will give the money that will allow the outreach programs that we're talking about, for example. Uh, so there's, there's lots of reasons why they will, will grant those. My view is if you think that that's unfair and is causing a reduction in the ability of underrepresented students to come, get rid of legacy preferences. That was the argument we made. We said, get rid of it. Michigan fought that tooth and nail. The president, Lee Bollinger, at the time testified, we're not doing it. The dean of the law school testified at the time, we're not doing it. That's too important. I'm sure Harvard and, and Princeton haven't given up. Uh, I'm sure preferences are still there. Texas A&M, they, they eliminated racial preferences. So there's a there's another example of what Texas A&M was trying to do, and you can imagine. They eliminated and legacy, legacy preferences. Legacy. Not I, racial I, racial. I said what I say? Racial, racial. I, well, they did eliminate racial too, but legacy. They eliminated legacy preferences, much to the chagrin of a lot of the Texas A&M alumni. Mm -hmm. So, it, but that's a, you know, again, that's a question that an administration has to answer. You can make your own judgments. I'm 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 actually agnostic about it. I have three kids, none of them attended my college. Uh, so, and they didn't try, uh, so it didn't matter. But, uh, so I don't have a problem with it. I think it's a much different issue than, than, than race. Athletic preferences, Bowen and Bach were very much in favor of those. Mm -hmm. they, 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 if you'll recall, they said that adds something tremendous to the school. So they, they, they and then Bowen, I think, wrote a later book and, uh, yeah. Yeah, about, about that very subject. So, no, I don't have, uh, you know, it's a different issue than race. Race is too divisive. We, don't, we need to get rid of it. That's, in, that's my view. That's my hard view. I just don't want us to be divided along the lines of skin color. Oh, no, you, you said that well. I don't have anything to add to that. I, I will make the remark that the observation in the book that the admission of legacy or transgenerational relationship students at a higher rate than black students is, of course, nothing surprising or significant statistically. The ends are different. Uh, so, so if you're practicing both, that's going to be a natural result, not an unnatural result. So there's nothing to be learned from it. Other questions? Does someone in the back? Yes, thank you. Yeah. Um, and so this, this question is directed mainly to Dr. Allen, um, because I read your chapter from the book. And so um, at Williams, um, the words diversity and inclusion are used frequently in tandem. Um, and so I was wondering, you know, in your book, you define both. Um, so how do you feel that Williams and other elite institutions are misusing the word inclusion by combining it with diversity? And what can we learn from your distinction of the two words? Well, I think the first and most important thing to learn is that what I emphasized was the uh, really urgent necessity to begin rebuilding community. And insofar as the use of the word inclusion is leading in that direction, I commend it. I think it's a good thing. It's beginning to emphasize that we're not a collection of separate tribes. But if it's done in tension with other practices that reinforce tribalism, then it means it's a halfway house we've arrived at. We haven't gone all the way. And so I'm, I'm just fervent in saying, let's make the whole journey. Let's go all the way and reinforce community. Let's enable people to understand that they are part of something greater than themselves, rather than reinforcing the separate identity as the only valuable thing that we can raise a flag to on our campuses. There's nothing wrong with the fact that people come from different backgrounds. That's the, this is simply the most diverse society in certain respects on the face of the earth. There's just no way around that. That's a fact empirically. So, so that embracing that is wonderful. But then interiorizing the idea of diversity is something different. For well, that's pushing people away rather than bringing them together. We ought to be able to separate those two functions of the meeting. The word diversity is a good word. I'm not saying the word can't be used. I'm saying we shouldn't worship it where it has disintegrative tendencies in the community. And we should instead replace the term that is integrated or assimilated tendencies in the community. 
Now, I realize there is some degree of scholarship that lies behind the whole notion of validating people's experiences or building people up or giving people a sense of dignity by respecting their cultural backgrounds or showing that one is valued no more highly than another. There are a whole series of things like that that one can observe and to some of which one can even assent. But to raise them to a level beyond the level of what organizes the community as a community is a bad idea. It's destructive. And so only people who are extremely judicious, who have very good judgment, can play with both diversity and inclusivity. Most people aren't that talented, and therefore they ought to pragmatically settle on the side of inclusivity in order to avoid the dangers of diversity. Okay. We have time for one last question. Somebody, we have, a, we have a second shot. Yes, go around. Yeah, sorry, I'm just following up on uh, sort of what you guys were speaking about. And given that we've sort of defined race now as something that, uh, or I guess the term diversity is something that divides us, to what, ex like, how much explanatory power does wealth or socioeconomic status have as also being a factor that divides people along different lines? Like, why wouldn't we apply the same criteria that we've been using for race to that variable as well, which also separates people just in a different context? Let me take that first, Larry. If you mean by divide, define, then I'll agree with you. All attributes are defining. And so people who stand in different relations to one another, whether by virtue of wealth or religion or all a long list of factors, will be by that defined as standing in a differing relationship to others. So, so I don't think that we are at all ruling that out. But if you mean by divide, not define, <coughs> if you mean that there are impermeable barriers between groups based on principles of identity, then I think you're mistaken. But not only are the barriers not impermeable, but there is a great value in our being prepared to breach them, to reach across, to affirm fellow humanity in every human being wherever the human being comes from. Uh, I was having this conversation recently with some folk, and we were talking about what it means to embrace humanity. And I, I pointed out that this general commitment to humanity is meaningless unless you can actually embrace a human being. You can't embrace humanity without embracing a human being. Finding that human being beneath the identifying distinction you're talking about that's the work of education. That's the truth we're trying to get to. We're trying to get the truth behind the appearances. And so what I'm urging you to do is not to dwell on the appearances, but to seek out the reality of each person's life. Give each human being the dignity of being taken in that human being's own terms, his or her own presentation, not some preconceived definition or identity. That's a tall order. That's never been easy to do. But the one thing that is worthwhile in this society is we have proved that it's doable. What we haven't proved is that we're willing to keep doing it. There seems often among us a tendency to give up on that worthwhile effort and to substitute slogans and general characterizations. What the heck? I say all those silly words. Stereotypes in place of human encounter. We have to avoid substituting stereotypes for human encounters. All I can say is I've got, as I said earlier, I've got ultimate faith in mm -hmm. the young people highest compliment that any of us can give is to hold every one of those kids, young men, young women, to the
the same high standard. That's your only, that's the only thing you can do to, to truly demonstrate that you see them as equal. They may not reach a standard, irrespective of their race, white, black, you know, Hispanic, you know, Asian, but it doesn't matter. But the compliment of holding them, expecting, believing that they have that opportunity and if they put the effort forth, they can do it. And I think that, that it, again, that that's something that we ought to be striving for. Just believing that every kid can do it. You, you demonstrate that you've overcome some obstacles, I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna give you a, a, a couple extra points in my mind if I'm on the admissions committee. But it has nothing to do with your race. You can be poor white, you can be poor Latino, you can be poor Asian, you can be poor black. And I, you're gonna get the same treatment. So, but it's the same high standard. Again, I'd like to thank everybody for taking the time to come here and participate in this very important and substantive discussion. Um, if you'd like to learn more about Society for Conservative Thought events, you can contact me at my Unix JJD6. Um, but otherwise, I want to thank you all for coming out. Um, if you have any feedback or further questions about the event, myself and other faculty organizers will be available to chat. Um, but beyond that, thank you so much for coming, and have a good night.